Will the congregation please rise? grace, and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to give thanks to God for the life of Richard Anton Urig, to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit and to proclaim the good news of eternal life in Jesus Christ. It is also a blessing as we gather this day for Dick's family that Ellie's ashes are here as well that these two urns may now symbolize the union they shared in their marriage. And so we turn to commend them both to Almighty God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Through our service today, several of Ellie and Dick's children will lead us in portions, uh, and now Kathy will share a prayer with us. God Almighty, today we have come together to commemorate the patriarch of our family, who has passed from being with us to being with you. Yet even as we mourn our loss, we know that death is not the final word. As God the Father, you have brought us all into being, loving and guiding us throughout our lives. As God the Son, you have taught us that death is just the beginning of eternal life. And as God the Spirit, we turn to you for the comfort and consolation that we need. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we praise your holy name. Amen. Thank you. Our first hymn is number one, Holy, Holy, Holy. I invite you, if able, to stand as we sing.
Please be seated. Let us now ask God to cleanse our hearts, to redeem our memories, and to renew our confidence in the goodness of God. Let us offer our confession. God of mercy, whose loving kindness endures forever, we confess that we have often failed to receive and give love, to care for others as we care for ourselves, to forgive and accept forgiveness. We remember good intentions that were not put into actions, harsh words that were hurtful, selfish purposes that caused pain, persistent pride that would not yield. We acknowledge our fear in the face of death, and our failure to accept the hope you offer us in Christ. Gracious God, forgive us and help us to forgive others. Heal us from the pain of self-condemnation. Free us from the burden of failures that cannot be corrected. Renew us with your loving assurance that our sins have been forgiven. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And I declare to you that in the name of Jesus Christ, this day we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. One of the things about Dick's family is that they are truly a collaborative group. Y'all have worked long and hard on this. So throughout the service, as I mentioned before, Several, part, several children of Dick and Ellie will share, and we begin with our scripture readings, which they all talked about and planned and chose. So our scriptures and our hymns were all chosen by the family. We begin with an Old Testament reading by Tom, followed by a Psalter from Shirley. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 41, 10, 13. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will, with, I will uphold you with my victorious right hand, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. I'm reading Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness for all generations. Our second hymn is number 65. Please stand, if able.
A reading from Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Mary. And now to share some remembrances, sons Rick Urig and Bobby. Seems like I was here not too long ago. Hmm. Back again. I'm Rick. I'm one of Ellie's and Dick's uh, eight children, of course. I want to begin by thanking everyone for being here. It is truly wonderful to see a turnout for Dad, especially as we are learning to adjust to what we hope is a post-pandemic world. Dad has a great story, and it deserves to be heard. But there is more, much more, than can be said in the few minutes my siblings have allowed me. So I'll pick and choose and try to be succinct. Also, uh, when we were here a year ago to memorialize mom, and now we're here to, to dad, I, I want to admit that I'm free, freely and shamelessly reusing some of the better material from a year ago. So forgive me for that. Richard Ant Neurig was born in New York City on October 2nd, 1930, the son of Kurt Urig and Pauline Sachs, recent immigrants from Germany. He passed last late last year on December 17th at the age of 91. For those who are counting, you knew I was going to do this. He lived and breathed in this world for 32,315 days. Dick's early life was hard, much harder than most of us will, did experience or will experience in our own lives. He was born less than a year after the great stock market crash of 1929. His father and uncle had worked in the back rooms of a Wall Street brokerage and had invested their life savings in the market and lost just about everything when the bubble burst. Timing is everything. At his birth, the family lived at 390 Wadsworth Avenue in Manhattan. Dick, his parents, his older sister Ruth, an uncle, two aunts, and a cousin, all crammed into a single apartment. The only breadwinner for the family was Aunt Frieda. She had a job working for the German consulate. Over the next decade, the family moved from apartment to apartment in Manhattan. His father, Kurt, had a hard time finding and holding a job. He turned to the bottle. Many nights, a young Dick and his older sister, Ruth, were sent out to search the bars and retrieve their father. In 1939, with dim economic prospects in New York, Kurt and Uncle Tony returned to Germany to go into business there with Uncle Hubert. And I'll spare you the full genealogy, but I will mention a few more names as we go along. The next week after, England and France declared war on Germany. Once again, timing is everything. Dick, Pauline, and Ruth stayed behind so Ruth could finish high school. Then in 1941, shortly after Dick turned 11, they left for Germany so the family could be reunited. A week later, the U.S. declared war on Germany. Once again, timing is everything. At first, the war went well for the Germans, and things were good. Then the tide turned. The family lived in the east in the city of Cutbus. Dick remembered when Cutbus was bombed. He recalled returning home that day to find the homes to the left and right bombed out, but they are still standing. That was February 15, 1945. Things were getting really bad. The Russians were closing in. It was going to be payback time, and no German wanted to be captured by the Russians. It was time to head west and be captured by the Americans or the Brits. There were cars, of course, but no gas to put in them. Walking was the only means of transport. Kurt, Pauline, Ruth, and Dick put what they could into a handcart and started walking. Dick remembered walking within about 10 miles of Dresden, it had been bombed the same day as Cutbus. He vividly recalled 
that even at that distance, the stench of death was terrible. He was just 14. They were eventually captured by the Americans and put into a displaced person camp near Würzburg. Dick was in a very unique position. He was a US citizen by birth and a native English speaker. The Americans there didn't really speak German, nor did they understand the local economy. The Germans didn't speak English. He was at the intersection of both and rose to a position of responsibility within the camp. When he spoke of it, and he, that didn't happen very often, he told stories of making deals to procure supplies for the camp, having and driving his very own Jeep, and generally of being the man of the camp. He was still just 14 years old. Dick was finally able to return to the States in August of 46. On his return, he was taken in by Aunt Lena and Uncle Will. Although he had a home, his uncle was very cool towards him, garnishing his wages for room and board. Dick remembered being an outcast at school. He recalled that in Germany, he was always that American kid. And then when he returned to the US and went to Cliffside Park High School, he was that German kid. As he recalled, he couldn't win, wasn't popular, and didn't have many friends. After two years, he graduated in 48. It seemed like he took a gap year to work and earn some money for college, and then he entered Lafayette College in 1949. Dick attended with support from a program like our OTC, which didn't quite exist at that time. He recalled receiving a small stipend of about $47 a month. This not, did not include tuition. After his first year, the school found some a little bit of a stipend for him, but basically everything came from working, begging, and borrowing. He did it on his own and graduated in 1953. Rewind back a couple years to the summer of 51. Dick, then a rising junior at Lafayette, found summer employment at Lenape Village, a rustic family resort in the Poconos. He returned for the summer of 1952. There he met the owner's daughter, Ellie Kaiser. At some point, acquaintance blossomed into romance. We now know that between September 21st of 52 and June 4th of 53, a period of only 257 days, brace yourself for this, Dick wrote Ellie at least 60 times. I know, nobody can believe that he ever wrote that many letters in his life. Ellie saved them, tied them with a red ribbon, hidden in a trunk of memories in the garage on Purcell Street for over four decades it was hidden in that garage. And let me tell you, that man could write a love letter. You'd never expect it, but he could. He wooed her hard. Dick was at Lafayette in Easton, PA, but Ellie, uh, Ellie was at Cornell in Ithaca, New York. In early 53, he traveled to Cornell for the winter dance and to propose. In, 1920, in 2021, rather, he recalled paying $5.50 for the bus ticket, $17.49 for the flowers, and commenting that every penny had to be counted. They set a date. It was to be August 8, 19, 1953. But Ellie's mother and stepfather would be traveling in and out of the country. Could they reschedule the wedding? We'll throw you a big wedding, they said. And then a second request to reschedule came. It was evident that the delaying tactics were unlikely to abate. So Ellie took a bus to Fort Benning, Georgia, where Dick was stationed, and on November 7, 1953, they eloped. They were married for 67 years until her death early in 2021. Dick and Ellie became parents in 1955, then again in 56, 58, 60, 61, 63, 64. Oh yeah. And to everyone's surprise and utter delight, 73. And that is perhaps the primary reason why there's so many of us here today. Immediately after the marriage, newly commissioned Lieutenant Urich, U.S. Army, shipped off to Europe. His bride, Ellie, was able to follow a few months later. Dick was stationed in Germany for five years, living in many different locations across the country. Oberammergau, Bad Nauheim, Würzburg, Schweinfurt, Oberumsdorf. I probably didn't pronounce that last one right. They returned stateside in uh, 58. 
Rejects early assignments took them to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Fort McClellan, Alabama, and Pelos, New York. In 67, they moved to Chester, Virginia, and resided at their house at 12710 Percival Street for nearly 44 years until 2011. They then moved to a retirement community of Lucy Corps. Rewinding back to 1953, Dick started out in the infantry. Because of his German language skills and his detailed knowledge of Germany, he was transferred into what I'm going to call counterintelligence. I don't have the exact name of the organization, but he was doing counterintelligence. Then when he returned to the US, he served in the Chemical Corps, went and got an MBA at Syracuse University, and came back and did various assignments in logistics. Uh, not far from here in Delwood, Virginia, at what was then called the Defense General Supply Center. He was served on the general staff at the Pentagon, and then he was at Fort Meade teaching in the, I believe it was the quartermaster school there. And of course, from March 71 to March 72, he served his country in Vietnam. On April 30th, 1976, after serving his country for nearly 23 years, Dick retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel. After retiring, he briefly worked for Garcia Corporation in Teaneck, New Jersey until July 77. Then in 79, the Republican Party recruited him to run for treasurer of Chesterfield County. He ran a valiant but unsuccessful campaign. Then in 1980, or about then, Dick found his second act in life, serving with the Bensley Bermuda Volunteer Rescue Squad. Dick logged thousands of hours and hundreds of calls as a driver and paramedic. He also served as an instructor, as an instructor for EMT-8 and other paramedics. He also held a number of administrative positions, including chief of operations, vice president, and president. And if that wasn't enough, he volunteered for the Thomasdale High School uh, band boosters, serving as president of that organization for several years. Um, you can't talk about Dick and Ellie without mentioning bridge. Uh, they were both avid bridge players. They started playing in college. It was the thing to do. And it was central part of their early social life. They played together for many years and later in life with other partners. Dick especially loved the game. He also led a local duplicate bridge game, in game here in Chester for many years. So if I'm being honest, dad wasn't always the easiest person to be around. He could be loud. He could be unreasonable. He could be, well, we don't really need to enumerate the whole list. Um, but that is focusing really on the small picture. It's really important to step back and see the larger picture. And that larger picture informs us that Dad worked very hard to make sure that each and every one of us had a much better early life than he ever had. His role model for a father was not great. He gave us so much more than he ever experienced himself. The glass was not half, half empty. It was way more than half full. I'm winding down, finally, I promise, but I can't get off the stage without saying a few words about Beech Week. In 1974, mom and dad started a family tradition, trekking to Sandbridge, Virginia for a week of sun, sand, and getting on each other's nerves. It works, believe me. At first it was every year, then later every second or third year. In the early 70s, the Eurig 10 attended. By our last visit in 2018, it was the Eurig 38. Beach Week 2022 is nigh upon us. Tomorrow, many in this room, actually most in this room, will be heading to Sandbridge for the 24th edition. All eight of their children are attending, three from Virginia, one from North Carolina, two from Florida, one from Germany, and one from Japan, as well as grands, great-grands, a great-great-grand, spouses, significant others, cousins, and second cousins. I think the final count is at least 48, but it might be more. There's a certain uncertainty principle at work here, and it's hard to know exactly how many will be there. This will be the first time without mom and only the second time without dad. They will be missed, more importantly, remembered. 
Our Beach Week tradition is a living testament to both of them. And we all know that Wednesday of Beach Week was Dad's special day. That is the one day that he would agree to step out of the air-conditioned comfort of the cottage and into the ocean. Dad always preferred the mountains ever since Lenape Village. It's going to be tough to follow. I'm, I'm very grateful to have grown up in Chester, Virginia, Person Street. It was wonderful. Um, Dad wore many hats. Went by many names. We called him Colonel, Coach, Paramedic, Teacher, Linguist, and of course, Dad. And um, that to only name a few. Um, he traveled the globe and saw the terror of war from many different perspectives. He was the first person I knew who used a computer, and he took binary literally with one plus one equals ten from their marriage to the ten kids. <laughs> he taught us many things. He taught me many things. He taught me uh, mostly fundamentals. And although they may have been had specific import relating to sports or grammar or math. They all usually had life lessons in them. They had a broader relevance to life, love, and God. Above all, he taught me to think for myself. He would often ask me, usually early in the day, what have you done for God and country today? And it was inevitable. It was the kind of question that you knew was coming. And you better be prepared better have an answer, and it better be legit. Uh, most of my political beliefs sprouted from seeds that he planted, from his guidance and observations in Vietnam. Somewhere our ethos diverged, and as I learned, as I learned to think for myself. Later in life, we, we would stumble into an argument every time I visited. It, was just, it wasn't just politics, it was anything. And uh, we couldn't agree on it. And it was inevitable. But he always had a legitimate solution. He would put his left hand on my right cheek and, and kiss my left cheek. And I knew that it was safe, that, that um, I had defended neither God nor country, and I could travel in peace. We went to confirm his body as it lay in the funeral home, and I put my left hand on his right cheek and kissed his left cheek. Thank you, Dad, for giving me the focus. I only hope that I can contribute to humanity, which is a small fraction of what your legacy to God and country has been. He will be missed, and uh, Wednesday will be his day. Thank you. Once more, let us be united in prayer. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer, our rock and our refuge. Amen. When Jesus announced to his disciples the death of their dear friend, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus, he said, our brother Lazarus has fallen asleep. When Stephen was stoned, becoming the first martyr, it is said he fell asleep. Sleep is one of scripture's metaphors for death. And while I don't recommend using it with young children, they are way too literal. Expecting an awakening in a few short hours, the image in scripture is nonetheless an apt one. When early Christians referred to a burial ground, they used the word comaterium, which is the same in Greek and Latin. Our English word, of course, is cemetery. And it's derived from the same word that literally means 
sleeping chamber. Death, in a sense, is like sleep because it brings rest. Who can imagine anything more desirable or delicious than to lie down and sleep when weary after a hard day's work? It is rest from labor. One of the reasons why heaven was pictured as a place of rest for the ancients is that they were burdened with manual labor of daily living. Hence, being tired was practically a state of life. A heaven of sleep had fantastic appeal. Jesus even used it, as Mary shared earlier, that thought when he was inviting others to come and follow. Come to me, all you that are that labor and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Dick Urich now rests from an incredible journey that we just heard about, filled with service to the country through the army, service to the community and the rescue squad, patriarch of what can only be termed a clan. Eight children, 15 grandchildren, 10 great-grandchildren, and did I hear one more great-great in the mix now? Wow. <laughs> a friend and partner in the bridge community and an inveterate leader, my favorite image of Dick is thinking of his running off and eloping after all those delays from Ellie's family. But there were other images visiting them at Spring Armor as Ellie told stories, asked questions, and shared tales. Dick would sever so often sort of turn down the corner of a paper, one that was next to him on those stacks of papers and magazines that were by his chair. And he would deem to say hello to the preacher who interrupted his afternoon. Or the monthly communion gatherings that we shared in another's apartment. Ellie was always there, month in, month out. But every so often, she was a little sprier, for she could have nudged Dick to join us. And he would dutifully share in the service, but there was little small talk before or after. But from my vantage point, and I think from yours, Dick and Ellie adored one another, were dedicated to each other, and complimented each other forming a strong bond, one that forged a clan. As noted, in thinking about the young and this metaphor, picturing death as sleep indicates an awakening in the morning. A child brings focus to the next sunrise. At our age, we better grasp the sunrise of Christ's kingdom it's the dawn of Christ's new day. Some are privileged to hold an early childhood memory of a mother or a father tucking you into bed. I think that's part of what we will do when we say the Lord's Prayer in just a few moments. Those memories share a word of assurance, a prayer, as we noted, a good night kiss even. And then a child goes to sleep, content. Confident that you would be refreshed when awakened in the morning and the light of a new dawn. And you knew that you would find father or mother's love continuing just where the good night kiss left off. A World War I British chaplain, an Anglican priest named G.A. Stutter Kennedy, put it this way in a poem. So I looked up to God. And while I held my breath, I saw him slowly nod and knew as I had never known aught else, with certainty sublime and passionate, shot through and through with sheer unutterable bliss, I knew there was no death but this, God's kiss, and then the waking to an everlasting love. U.S. Senate chaplain and Presbyterian minister Peter Marshall suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 46 and as he was being taken from the family's home by ambulance to the hospital, he kissed his wife and his teenage son and then said confidently, I'll see you in the morning. 
Those were his last words to them. He died before seeing them again. Nevertheless, he articulated our faith. We do believe that in the morning, in God's new day, we will see one another. So then we can say on this day and at this last, thanks be to God for one such as Dick Mood. Well done, faithful servant. May he now know rest from his labors as we look to that day of God's dawn when we shall see mom and dad once again. Thanks be to God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, creator of life and comforter to those who mourn, grant us peace in our hearts as we mourn the loss of the hero. While we commemorate his life on earth, turn our sadness into gladness with the knowledge that he is now in heaven, home with you. His years of service to his country and his many volunteer activities attest to his Christian love for his neighbor. A very reserved man, he nevertheless, nevertheless was caring in his own way, and he is truly missed. Thank you, Lord, that Dad is now free of earthly suffering and can rest in your divine peace. Together, together we lift our voices in the prayer your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in Hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And over. Amen. Once more, let us be at prayer. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of all. You are mortal. O oh God, we are formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. So into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant Dick. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. And we commend to you your servant Ellen. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him in the arms of the Lord, the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Our final hymn this afternoon is number 649, Amazing Grace. If able, I invite you to stand.
O God of people and nations, we, pa we pause at the close of this funeral to acknowledge again your sovereignty over our lives and our country. We remember before you our father, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, and friend, now has departed this life. We honor him for his loyalty to God and country, for his good deeds and friendship. May he rest in peace, and may the good works you began in him be continued through each of us. Please give us safe journeys to our homes. Amen. After the family departs, worshipers are invited to head to the fellowship hall and be there to greet the family after we do the memorial garden. I invite you to do that. 